Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this CAFI webinar on principles-based regulation, or PBR, the emergence of rulemaking authority and how they work together, a complementary harmonious fit or dynamic tension for Canada's insurance regulators. My name is Keith Martin, and I am co-executive director of the Canadian Institution, Canadian Association, excuse me, of Financial Institutions in Insurance, or CAFI. We are delighted to be joined today by two leading Canadian experts in this regulatory area. Dr. Christy Ford is a full tenured professor at the Peter A. Allard School of Law, University of British Columbia. She obtained her graduate degrees from Columbia Law School. Before joining academia, she practiced law in Vancouver and New York. Professor Ford's research focuses on regulation and governance in Canadian, American, and international finance and securities regulation, access to justice, and legal professional regulation. She has been retained on several occasions by the Canadian Department of Finance to advise on banking and securities regulation. Professor Ford has published extensively in leading academic journals and handbooks and written two books. She lectures nationally and internationally and has held visiting research positions at institutions, including the European University Institute, Hebrew University, Oxford University, and Utrecht University. Stuart Carruthers is a partner at Steichman Elliott and a member of their insurance and reinsurance, financial products and services, and mergers and acquisitions groups. He is widely recognized as the preeminent transactional, commercial, governance, and regulatory advisor to insurance and reinsurance companies and brokers in Canada. Stuart is repeatedly cited for both his transactional and regulatory expertise in the industry by numerous leading directories. Stuart has particular expertise in insurance, reinsurance, and related financial services, transactions, and regulatory matters. He has acted on more than 30 completed sales of Canadian insurance companies, and he also serves as the volunteer outside advisor to the Regulatory Affairs Committee of the Insurance Bureau. Welcome, Christy and Stuart. On behalf of myself and my co-executive director colleague, Brendan Wicks, and the CAFI Board of Directors, thank you to all attendees for joining our webinar today. CAFI is a not-for-profit industry association dedicated to the development of an open and flexible insurance marketplace. Our 15 members include the insurance arms of Canada's major banks and credit unions, along with their insurer business partners, which underwrite credit protection insurance and travel insurance. Now, this is the third of three CAFI webinars that you'll be holding in the first half of 2022, all of which are principally or primarily focused on issues related to life and health insurance policy and regulation in Canada. I do wanna mention that if you have any questions that you would like to pose to one or more of our two panelists during the Q&A session for which we have allotted 20 minutes, uh, please send them to me as the host using the Q&A function of Zoom and I will pose them on your behalf. Unless you specifically request in your question that you wish to be identified as its source, I will pose all questions on an anonymous basis. And just before we get underway, I want to extend a special welcome to some VIP guest attendees. And many representatives from our 15 CAFI member companies and from our 10 associates, which supply essential services to our association and its members. We have attendees today from allied industry associations, such as the Canadian Life and Health Insurance Association, and from 15 insurance and financial services regulators and policymakers from across the country, including the following, the government of the Northwest Territories, the British Columbia Financial Services Authority or BCFSA, the British Columbia Ministry of Finance, the Insurance Council of BC, the government of Alberta, the Alberta Ministry of Finance, the Alberta Insurance Council, the Financial and Consumer Affairs Authority of Saskatchewan, or FCAA, the Insurance Councils of Saskatchewan, the Financial Services Regulatory Authority of Ontario, or FISRA, the Ontario Ministry of Finance, the Autorité des Marchés Financiers, or the AMF, the New Brunswick Financial and Consumer Services Commission, or FCNB, the Canadian Insurance Services Regulatory Organizations, or CISRO, and the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, or OSFIE. 
Welcome to you all. Now let's jump right into the webinar. Christy Stewart, let's get started. And Christy, I'm gonna begin with you and ask you just to give us a sort of ground work on what is principles-based regulation or PBR and how does it differ from rules-based regulation? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Keith. And thanks to Kathy for the opportunity to be part of this exciting uh, panel. Uh, so principles-based regulation is really, uh, I think uh, the best way to think of it is as a changed approach uh, uh, to how to regulate. And I guess I would identify maybe four points about principles-based regulation that are really core to it. And the first would be this idea that, um, that, that more of the regulatory rules or, or, or requirements would be cast at a higher level of generality. So people talk about the distinction between principles and rules as being between, you know, so a rule about speeding would say, thou shalt not go more than 60 kilometers per hour. Whereas a principle would say, thou must uh, drive in a manner that's reasonable and prudent in all the circumstances. And so you can see how the principle is uh, more open-ended, subject to more interpretation, but also potentially better suited to, uh, uh, to, to situations uh, depending on the facts on the ground. And so, uh, so the idea behind principles-based regulation, the first point would be to really sort of see more uh, regulatory requirements cast at this higher level of generality uh, so, that, um, so, so that there's room for flexibility uh, depending on the situation at hand. And that, you know, the, the, the um, follow on to that would be that whenever a new situation arises, the regulator's uh, first job should not be to build a new rule, rather to think about whether or not the existing rule can cover that situation uh, already. So to sort of think in a, in a more sort of systems level about what the overarching regulatory uh, uh, regime is, is meant to look like. Uh, I guess my second point would be that principles-based regulation makes a lot of sense in particular kinds of contexts. So if you're working in an environment characterized by fast moving change, technological innovation, a complex regulatory environment or a heterogeneous one where you've got multiple different kinds of regulated entities who have different characteristics, uh, one size of rule won't fit all. And so those are the kinds of situations where uh, detailed rules tend not to be very well fitting and tend not to be able to, uh, to respond to this complex, heterogeneous, potentially fast moving environment. So uh, as well, when you're dealing with those kinds of complicated regulatory environments, the problem that a regulator, a rules-based regulator would run into would be uh, sort of basic access to information problems. Uh, and so uh, a principles-based regime allows regulators to work more with industry actors and uh, it, who have a better understanding of what their particular business must look like. So the regulator uh, would set the overarching principle uh, or the overarching regulatory requirements that must be met and then work with industry actors to sort of fill in the details to add meat to those bones depending on the particular context uh, that that or the particular risks that that particular business is running. Uh, and so for my third point there would, would be really that principles-based regulation works most effectively when it's outcome-oriented and data-driven as opposed to process-oriented. So the idea would be that the regulator would set out the broad regulatory requirements that regulated entities must meet rather than setting sort of bright line or detailed rules, which may be overbroad or under-inclusive depending. And so uh, the principle is set at a high level of generality. And then there's a clear focus on ongoing conversation with regulated entities, a focus on results, a focus on data, and a focus on a, a sort of a collaborative approach to the extent that it's possible. Um, constantly measuring outcomes and having a, an ongoing conversation about what achieving those principles looks like for any particular industry actor. So, you know, data and an outcome orientation is really essential. Um, and then I guess my fourth observation would be that this cooperation is very important. Uh, Principles-based regulation assumes a level of ongoing conversation and, conversation and cooperation between regulators and regulated entities. But 
there also has to be an enforcement component. It has to be backstopped by, uh, by an enforcement uh, component, what William O. Douglas called the shotgun behind the door. So as long as you have a shotgun behind the door, the hope is that you never have to use it, that it, the presence of an enforcement mechanism um, has a, um, you know, a sort of a um, clarifying effect for everybody who's involved in the conversation. So if you think about a rules-based regime, uh, the um, tax uh, the regime in Canada is often thought to be a, a sort of classic rules-based regime. Uh, and what we see in that environment is the sort of cat and mouse behavior, right? So people, corporations will identify a loophole after which the CRA will try and close the loophole with a detailed exception or clarification after which people will try to find another loophole. So this sort of cat and mouth most behavior uh, and the sort of gotcha uh, perspective on the part of regulators is very much not what principles-based regulation is about. It's really, I think, more like, I guess, industry actors would think about their relationships with other stakeholders like bondholders or others. There's a mutual interest in you know, on the part of both the regulators and the regulated entities in an ongoing successful enterprise in, in this case, the insurance sector, uh, it doesn't mean that the regulator doesn't ultimately have an important obligation to the public, which they must safeguard. Uh, so uh, they, they can't forget about that, but, uh, but on the day-to-day -day basis, so long as things are working well, an ongoing collaborative relationship, ongoing communication with frontline regulators is really essential to filling in uh, the details around the broad principles. Uh, if I can just take Christy. two more minutes, uh, sorry, Martin. I just so so an example uh, that comes mm -hmm. to mind uh, is actually FISRA's uh, UDAP, the Unfair or Deceptive Acts or Practices Rule. So um, it's it, it's interesting to me. This is uh, it's a rule that is only eight pages long, and it's based on broad open concepts like unfair or deceptive acts or unfair discrimination. And it's aimed at deterring conduct that could reasonably be expected to um, produce unfair outcomes. And I think this is exactly the kind of principles-based regime that makes sense when dealing with something like unfair or deceptive acts or practices or fraud, uh, where new ways of sort of, uh, of, of behaving uh, keep keep emerging and, uh, and, and so through ongoing conversation about what the UDAF actually means with industry actors and focusing on outcomes rather than on some detailed set of rules, uh, that, that, um, that rule has the potential to really create um, a more effective regulatory regime in regard to unfair and deceptive acts and practices. And it's not, it's not meant to be vague forever, right? What constitutes an unfair act or an unfair practice will be filled in over time through ongoing conversation with regulated entities, through guidance, through enforcement actions where necessary. So the fact that it's only eight pages long doesn't mean it's meant to be vague forever. It means that the content can be fluid and can move as uh, circumstances evolve. That's very interesting, Christy. I'm, I'm going to come back to you on some of these enforcement and rule-based elements of a, a PBR regime. But first, I'd like to turn to Stuart and ask him to talk to us about something that certainly CAFE as an association and its members have uh, focused more on due to uh, regulatory emphasis on this, and that's the fair treatment of customers. And I'd like you to just comment, uh, Stuart, on where does principle-based regulation um, you know, you know, fit in with F FTC. What is the relation and interplay between principles-based regulation and this emphasis on fair treatment of customers? Thank you, and thank you, Keith, and thank you, Kathy, and hi to everyone. And honored to be alongside Christy, and and, and delighted to be here. I mean, I, I'd say that FTC or TCF, as they call it in the UK, is is the natural outcome or the natural outgrowth of a PBR regime and the predecessor regimes, more prescriptive regimes, I mean, they, they also had as their outcome that people would be treated fairly, but the current focus on this and particularly in the last 15 years or so in the UK and here in Canada, you, you know, I think is the, is the natural result. And again, as Christy said, very focused uh, 
on the outcome and the outcome being highway safety or less highway accidents. And that was the outcome, the intended outcome before too, but now we have this different process that's different in a number of ways that, that Christy described. And as I mentioned, this, this arises out of the UK and in, certainly in the insurance sector and uh, really addressed originally some issues that were present in the UK, but not to the same extent in Canada. But going back to 2007, the then UK regulator called the FSA, it's now divided between two regulators, the, there's the uh, prudential regulator, the PRA, and the conduct regulator, the FCA. But the old FSA put out one of the first papers on principles-based um, you know, principles in the insurance sector. And that continued to get traction. This is, you know, again, still more in the insurance area, lots of work going on in the securities and other financial services areas, but continued to get tra traction coming out of the global financial crisis. And in parallel with the International Association of Insurance Supervisors or IAIS, adopting their insurance core principles for their members, including OSFI and some of the provinces to consider and adopt in their own home jurisdictions. And, and coming out of the financial crisis, you had less of a focus going forward on prudential and pure solvency regulation and much more of a focus on market conduct, governance, risk management, and, and, and so on. So coming out of that process, eventually you get to their insurance core principles or ICPs. And ICP 19 is the conduct of business one, which underlies a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the FTC you know, governance. And as, as one of the key themes coming out of ICP-19 and the FC uh, for achievement of customers is looking at the product across its entire life cycle. From the design and pricing of the product to the sale of it, to the servicing of it, to claims payment, to complaints handling. And it should be a loop. You go through that and you should be sort of iterating and building on that. And that's one of the really kind of one of the Fair treatment of customers' mantras is looking at it across the uh, across the whole life cycle. And it, really, to some extent, Stuart, it's about culture, isn't it? It's about a culture of treating at every step of the process customers fairly. I I would agree with that, and and to be thinking about it in a sort of holistic way, and each step should you know should should be defensible and. You know, most organizations talk about being customer centric or being customer oriented, but I, I think that is 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 really what it's what it's all about. And so it, we'll maybe touch upon it later, but I, I think it definitely does call upon a different culture or a different set of mindsets to make it work, both for regulators and and for industry. But we can uh, we can talk a bit about that later on. Thank you, Stuart. Christy, let's talk a little bit more about PBR on the one hand and rules-based regulation on the other hand. And uh, I know in, in our pre-meeting to prepare for this, one of the points you made is that um, they're, they're not necessarily at odds with each other. They're, they're complementary and they need to work together. And so in, in terms of how they fit together on the spectrum of approaches, could you elaborate on that and explain why they're not in conflict? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I guess when you think about it at a conceptual level, it's, it's sometimes useful to say principles are these things that are cast at a high level of generality that set up, you know, broad overarching ideas and rules are these sort of detailed things that say you have 10 days measured as follows to do the following thing and have, you know, lots of detailed uh, prescriptive process oriented things. But, um, you know, so it's helpful to think about these two things as sort of models, but the reality is that there's no such thing as a completely principles-based or a completely rules-based regulatory regime. There can't be, uh, because there are always going to be some areas where a, a principle makes more sense and where you can't specify perfectly what uh, outcome you want as a regulator. And there are always going to be places where uh, a rule is necessary, for example, to make sure that, um, I don't know, procedural matters uh, during an arbitration are uh, handled in a fair and equitable way across customers or something. So it's not either or. Um, and I guess I would also say that even if you have a statute that looks very rules-based, it is, you know, as so much of principles-based regulation comes down to what Stuart was talking about, about the approach and comes down to the mindset. and. Implementation is so, so important. So 
Um, you know, every system will be a question, will be a mix of both. Uh, and the question is really how much of each to have and how to tailor the mix. Um, and if you think about the pros and cons of each one, so rules, uh, uh, you know, can have some real benefits. They can promote precision, uh, predictability, certainty. Uh, they can reduce the likelihood of arbitrariness or too much discretion uh, on the part of regulators. And on the negative side, they can be rigid, they can be reactive, they can be downright unfair, they can be over-inclusive or under-inclusive or poorly tailored to a particular situation, insensitive to particular facts, they can restrict communication, uh, and they can, as I mentioned earlier, per per permit this sort of loophole cat and mouse behavior where, um, where there's an incentive to abide by the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. So, you know, so, so there are pros and cons. And similarly, principles have benefits. They can be flexible. They can adapt to changing circumstances over time. Uh, they can allow decision makers to develop context appropriate responses to different situations, to exercise discretion, to reduce unfairness. And their negative signs are the flip side of all of that, right? They can be unpredictable. Uh, they can be uncertain. They do allow a lot of discretion to frontline regulators. And so, uh, so really, it, implementation is, is, is where a, a well, an effective principles-based uh, regulatory regime has to operate. So, uh, so uh, rather than keeping principles vague forever, what you really want is an ongoing dialogue between regulators who at the front line have expertise and uh, knowledge and resources and have relationships with industry, um, you know, and then industry actors who are prepared to um, engage in this ongoing conversation with regulators so that you're constantly filling in the details of those principles in ongoing context sensitive tailored ways that um, you know can get as close as possible to as a win-win as often as possible but so again it's not you don't have to choose between rules with all their pros and cons or principles with all their pros and cons a principles-based approach looks to principles first and thinks about this outcome-oriented perspective, but there is always going to be a place for rules as well. Yeah, we see that dynamic tension quite a bit in our association, Christy, because we, we often encourage the regulators to be principles-based, and then um, perhaps a regulator comes out with a guideline quite high level, and we'll go back and say, could you clarify exactly what you mean by this element of the guideline? Exactly, uh, um, you know, not 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 so principles based asking for more detail and i think ultimately the way that gets resolved is as you said is, is dialogue and conversations so that everybody's expectations can be understood Stuart, let's step back a, a moment before we get into a little bit more detail and look at the pros and cons of principles based regulation and even the rationale for its deployment can you walk us through that from a regulatory and from a regulated entities perspective Thank you, and um, Christy's touched upon some of these already, but I mean, pros would include uh, the ability to respond for both the industry and regulators to respond more quickly to changing circumstances or facts or developments. Laws and regulations are hard to change, whereas you know, rules or other principles-based guidance is easier to change and more flexible. Again, let's everybody focus on the desired outcome. Again, like highway safety, less accidents, is the, we, we shall be focused on that. Um, in theory, it should allow institutions a sort of lighter regulatory burden, or it should allow them to take the general and apply it more specifically, tailor it, tailor the implementation to their own approach and circumstance and risks. And you, you see that thinking in all the OSFI guidance, for example, it's always framed as institutions should take this guideline and apply it or adopt it to suit their own circumstances, risk profile products and so on. Um, there should be good transparency as a benefit just because the development of this kind of principles-based regulation requires a lot of collaboration and communication between regulators and institutions to make it work. So you sort of have that built in inherently. For, for regulators, because it's risk-based, it should allow them to focus their resources and every regulator has limited resources, but to focus their resources on the most risky risks. 
or the most pressing issues or the, you know, the most pressing risks and have the flexibility to do that. For industry, that should mean that in some ways there's less day-to-day -day supervision by regulators who have instead pushed down some of that governance and compliance and implementation down to the institutions themselves. So, you know, there should be less day-to-day. -day. And as I mentioned, it, it should foster a, a, a more open, a more communicative kind of relationship. Um, in, in terms of cons, I think there's some inherent ambiguity. And, and this is what you just mentioned, Keith, that you, it's great to get a high level guidance, but then there's ambiguity about, well, what does that really mean? Or what, what is what we're doing going to meet the regulators' expectations? Or what is this other firm down the street doing? They're doing it all different. And should we be doing what they're doing? Or I heard that at our home office, they tried this and it was a disaster. And so there's this sort of uncertainty in the process that you don't have where you just have the have the fixed, you know, 60 kilometer an hour um, speed limit. Um, as Christy said, you, you need, if, you're, if you're the regulator, you need good enforcement resources to make it work. You can't have all principles and no enforcement or no sort of shotgun behind the door, um, as, as Christy said. So I, I think you, you need that. In terms of a con, I, I actually think that it's more work for institutions to thoughtfully and well implement principles-based regulation principles or rules to meet their own circumstances and to, to really tailor to their own situation. It's easier to just know the speed limit is 60 and I'm gonna put on my cruise control. It's, it's more effort. It requires more people, more staff, more money to actually think about it, analyze it, implement it thoughtfully. And, and so, you know, I, I think there's actually a benefit to smaller firms having more prescriptive rules because it's, it's very easy to follow. It's, it probably takes a larger, better resourced firm industry participant to do a good job with principles-based regulation. So, you know, that's kind of a, that's kind of a pro um, and a con depending on, depending on who you are. Um, I mean, let me, let me pause there. I'll let Christy jump in. I, I mean, I think there's some good history in sort of how this came to Canada and some of the early things that OSFI and the AMF did early on, but let me, let me pause there. Yeah, well, thank you, Stuart, because um, I agree with so much of what you um, of, of what you said, and I think it's actually really important. Um, so there's an academic named Fred Schauer who has uh, S C H A U E R who has written a lot about what he calls the rulification of standards. Standards being sort of another word for principles, and uh, and his argument is that people often want clarity, and it takes a certain amount of forbearance and confidence to live with the ambiguity of a principle or, or a standard. And, and that's the case on the part of you know, regulators, but also on the part of regulated entities. And I think it, it does require a sort of a, a, a mental shift on both sides. So, and, and it probably does require more resources. Now, you know, the upside is real, but it can feel vague, I think, until you actually, you know, get into it and try to uh, try to understand how the principle makes more sense for your for your business. On the front end, uh, the incentive to go back to the regulator and say, well, what do you mean? We need more clarity. Um, and then the incentive for the regulator to say, well, what we mean is, and to provide something more rule-like is strong and, uh, a, you know, a really high functioning principles-based regime uh, would be one where both parties went into that understanding that the point is not to sort of nail it down forever uh, uh, and to create a rule out of something that was a principle. Instead, the, the point is to sort of work through particular problems, understanding that maybe the next problem is going to require a different kind of response. Um, and it requires, on the part of the regulator, a certain amount of confidence that um, you know, they understand what the principles are, they can provide this guidance to industry actors and um, you know, there's not a rule to hide behind, so to speak. You have to actually sort of bring your judgment to it and on the side of the regulated entities as well, um, instead of going back to the regulator and saying, well, what does this mean? Uh, you, know, you tell us what this means. It really does require the regulated entity to say, you know, to think themselves, what does this mean for us in our risk environment, in our compliance environment, and how do we, you know, when we go to the regulator, what's our pitch for how this makes sense for us in our environment? And 
Uh, and and so so I agree with with Stuart that you know a better resourced big firm is going to have real advantages because you can set up folks in the compliance department uh, who who do this all the time. And I think for regulators, it's important to make sure that there is support for smaller firms so that principles based regulation doesn't become a barrier to entry. Um, or a barrier to compliance. Um, and there are lots of different ways to do that, including you know, setting up sort of backstop rules for folks who um, don't have the internal capacity to sort of do this ongoing thinking. Uh, but, I, you know, but I should say, it, it sounds like more work. It probably is more work at the front end. Uh, it, this is not a light touch regime that is going to be, require fewer resources. But it will, but but the the payoff comes in much better tailored enforcement, in not having to worry about this cat and cat and mouse or you know gotcha behavior, in an ongoing relationship with the regulator that is um, you know effective and uh, uh, and and cooperative, and in sort of really ensuring that regulators tailor their enforcement resources to that you know small portion of repeat bad actors and everybody else can just go on with their business. Uh, and, and, and that's a real asset in terms of reducing the regulatory burden over the long haul. So at the end, um, hopefully it'll result in the principal objective of regulators being met, which is consumer protection. And uh, that's in everyone's interest, including the reputation of industry. So I would think that's another benefit potentially. Absolutely. Christy, I want to touch upon innovation, and um, I, I know that uh, Kathy often, um, in in its uh, encouragement of a PBR regime, uh, cites innovation as one of the reasons that it's it's less rigid a PBR regime, and so innovation is more likely to emerge. Um, but uh, I know in in discussions with you, um, you, you indicated that we need to be careful about thinking that all innovation is necessarily good or positive. So I'd, I'd love it if you could uh, share with our listeners some of your thoughts and insights on that issue. Yeah, you're really uh, uh, in, inviting me to get on my soapbox about this. Um, uh, so I spent a lot of time thinking about innovation and financial regulation in particular. And I, I do think that it's important to remember that innovation is not always beneficial by definition. And this is one of the things we learned in the financial crisis of 08-09. Uh, uh, Lord Turner in the UK pointed this out in his sort of postmortem uh, that there was this idea that more financial products, more sort of structured financial derivative products, uh, was in itself somehow going to perfect markets and uh, and and create some kind of broader social benefit, and that's not actually the case. Like just quantitatively more stuff on offer uh, isn't guaranteed to be a social net positive. So more innovative products, unless, you know, unless there's reason to think that, that you you know, that uh, people understand what they're buying and that there's an actual um, a, a benefit available there. I'm, I'm not just sort of a rah-rah, all innovation is great kind of person. Um, and I guess from my own perspective, I'm not, you know, so innovation, so let me, let me be clear, I'm not I'm not, I don't think all innovation is good, but I am very much pro-innovation in the big picture. I think, uh, you know, I, th I think it's important to understand sort of different kinds of innovation and different kinds of markets can have different kinds of effects. And so I guess I'm not entirely sure that principles-based regulation fosters product design innovation in particular, unless it, you know, it, it allows you to get away from certain kinds of overly rigid regulatory rules and create a new product that can still meet regulatory requirements. So there's some room there. Um, but I think really where the, uh, where the advantage to principles-based regulation is, is around uh, thinking about compliance uh, and how to modify, even innovate around compliance. Uh, so um, a principles-based regulation would allow firms uh, to sort of tailor their compliance structures to the risks they're actually running, rather than sort of having to tick a bunch of boxes or adopt, you know, or fit themselves into a one-size-fits-all regulatory regime. Uh, and and that may produce more business opportunities. It 
will also produce an opportunity to rethink uh, the, the compliance uh, side of the house. Now, fostering innovation in compliance is honestly a lot harder than fostering innovation in product design because there is a clear economic or competitive incentive to creating a new product that may be the first mover in a particular market, for example. But uh, thinking about how to modify compliance structures, how to innovate around uh, compliance structures in a way that can reduce the regulatory burden and be more effective as well in detecting and preventing internal compliance problems, you know, can create maybe a knock-on effect of opening up new opportunities for new products while still uh, staying on side the overarching regulatory requirements. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Stuart, before I move on to a, a, a different topic, do you want to just jump in on this innovation uh, issue? Well, I, I'm i pro-innovation too. I, I do think that, you know, a principles-based regime is more fertile ground or a more fertile environment for innovation, just in, in terms of mindset, flexibility, and typically the regulators who are the most principles-based are also the most sort of innovation-oriented, and you see that here in Ontario with FISRA and its new innovation office and, and framework, and, you know, innovation is part of FISRA's mission and, and supporting the de development of the financial services, you know, industry and services in Ontario is part of its mandate. And so, I, I mean, I, I think they sort of go hand in hand, that one may not be uh, a cause of the other, but I, I think it's, it's just, you know, sort of part and parcel of a, of a more principles-based regime. Part of it is mindset, part of it is just the regulatory approach. All right, thank you. And uh, I'm going to be going a little out of order in terms of the questions I'm asking, just because I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. You're a terrific panel, and uh, the time has just whipped by. I just want to make sure that that we cover as much as possible. So I'm I'm going to turn to you, Stuart, on um, you know the application implementation in Canada um, of uh, uh, principles-based regulation, and um, you know any comments you want to make that about that, especially in insurance. But I'm going to start off, Stuart, by asking you uh, uh, a question. I hope it's uh, <clears throat> it's it's possible for you to answer it, um, which is, do you think that, um, uh, you know, taking into account it's provincially regulated, so there'll be differences from province to province, but in general, do you feel in Canada that in insurance we have a, a PBR regime? No, I think we have a kind of a mixed or hybrid regime that's heading more and more in the direction of principles-based. Um, and I think there are some uh, jurisdictions that are kind of further down that journey than others. And with each new piece of federal or provincial and federal too, uh, guidance, uh, it's more and more and the kind of the seesaw is tilting over to a more you know, generally speaking principles based regime, but there's still, there's still a lot of prescriptive stuff at the provincial level and, and some at OSFI too. So I, I would say that, that it's still kind of, on the on the journey, and uh, I would say that it, you know some animals on the journey are doing some different things than others, and I'd say it's not a really harmonized journey. There's some disharmonization uh, that's happening with rulemaking powers and the tendency to make rules and to make varying rules and so on. So uh, I'd say that there's it, you know there's there's some different swim lanes going on, but. Uh, uh, I think we still still heading in that direction. And maybe on that uh, on that topic, Stuart, can you can you touch a little bit on provincial and nationally coordinated initiatives involving PBR? I mean, e even if different jurisdictions have PBR, right. one of the issues for our industry is that uh, in insurance there are seventeen regulators for uh, for an industry right. player, and the lack of harmonization can be a real cost, uh, a real inefficiency. So perhaps you could comment on, on that whole issue of harmonization and, and trying to coordinate uh, some of these initiatives. Yeah, so, so there are um, lots of sort of joint or collaborative initiatives going on, which are all good, um, particularly at the CCIR and CISRO level, um, both on treating customers fairly over the last few years, uh, incentive management, right now, um, lots going on there, lots of things that OSFI is doing. Um, but at the same time, 
there's lots going on sort of in separate provincial silos across, across the country. So you've got BC doing some things, New Brunswick has new powers and its own new rules. You've got, you know, the insurance councils in the Western provinces, you've got restricted insurance agent regimes in some provinces and coming in New Brunswick. And so you've got different things happening across the country, which is, which is a challenge. And in particular in the provinces that have new rulemaking powers. So that includes Ontario, BC, New Brunswick. And I think that there's a tendency that rulemaking powers result in more rules. And, you know, as we've joked and talked about, it's like the superhero movie where the superhero gets their superhero powers and they want to use their powers for good and to, and to bring justice and, and, and so on. So, you know, once, once regulators have that power or those authorities, naturally they will use it. And so you do get some disharmonized or differing approaches across the country and differing treatment of both products and actors. So if, if you look at how, you know, creditor insurance or extended warranties or electronics warranty slash insurance or what is what even is insurance is treated across the country. Still a lot of very different approaches as well. How MGAs or TPAs are treated across the country or what even is an, an MGA or a TPA? Is that a different thing in PNC versus life? And so it, there's, there's still a bit of disharmonization. And I think there's naturally a tendency, human nature, if you're developing a new rule, to take the best of what the other provinces have or what other regulators have and try to take the best and, and build on it and improve on it, which is human nature, and leave behind the things that you don't like, but you get a, a kind of a hodgepodge where things don't line up. And, and uh, I think that continues to be a challenge. Yes, so we do hear from our members that uh, one of the challenges is that they spend time on what I'd call exception management, where they're trying to understand you know, the subtle differences in wording from one regulator to another, as opposed to focusing on, on really the important part, which is meeting the expectations of the regulator. So I'm sure you've seen that as well, Stuart. Um, Christy, Stuart's sort of saying that in some cases, rulemaking authority leads to more rules and potentially can be a conflict with principle-based regulation. Um, in, in your mind, how much of a concern is that? Yeah, thank you. So, so I think I have a, a slightly different view uh, from Stuart on this. I, I mean, I rulemaking authority. What that really means is that the the regulator itself has the power to pass binding rules, and and you know, so there is this 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 maybe this risk that you know, if what you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. But the other alternative to rulemaking power on the part of the regulators would be for the legislator uh, to have the, that authority, and that's just a far you know, less uh, less flexible, less you know, expertise way to try and pass uh, regulatory expectations. So, you know, so I actually think rulemaking authority itself means it's it's in it's consistent with principles based regulation. It has the potential to be consistent because it means that you know frontline regulators have the ability to make rules or guidance and develop them quickly. You know, and to to sort of fill in the content of these principles in a, um, in a fast moving environment. But again, you know, as the BC Securities Commission does, I think the first question should always be, you know, what do we already have by way of principles that can cover this situation? So to sort of refrain from uh, your sort of first reaction to be to create a new rule uh, uh, without sort of thinking first about the big picture, about principles, uh, about things like harmonization. Uh, and and on harmonization, I mean, I, I feel uh, I, I feel as if it's a little bit reminiscent of conversations that were happening in securities regulation as well, where there are thirteen uh, separate regulators, and uh, and in the early two thousands, there was a sort of a new move to harmonize across jurisdictions. So Canada is the only developed economy in the world that doesn't have a national securities regulator. There have been various moves to create one, but what we've ended up with instead is uh, the Canadian Securities Administrators, which is a sort of an overarching umbrella, I don't know, talk shop where all where, where representatives from all the different provincial securities regulators get together and work out the content of a harmonized set of principles and guidance or rules, depending, 
uh, together. So they create, you know, they have this discussion in advance and then they use their rulemaking powers or equivalent powers in each province to enact that agreed upon national instrument at every provincial level. So you end up with an identical or near identical rules across provinces because the discussion happened in advance in this forum. And, you know, so it's, so I don't think rulemaking is inconsistent with principles-based regulation. I think it's actually necessary to principles-based regulation, but you know, it comes down to how you implement. Yeah, and, and Keith, I, I, I would just pick up on that. I would say too that, um, there's a disadvantage or a disharmonization, but at the same time, the upside or the benefit is that you've got lots of provincial regulators over time doing good things and taking good steps forward over time that is sort of moving uh, the field forward for everyone. So going back to the AMF and the original Sound Commercial Practices Guideline many years ago, up to everything that FISRA is doing, shout out to FISRA right now in terms of their principles-based guidance. I think that's really the their draft approach that's out right now. I think that's really kind of the high water mark in Canada provincially right now. And the, and the FISRA UDAP rule, as Christy mentioned, which has lots of you know reasonable reasonable expectations and, and so on in it. So lots that they're doing in parallel also with their innovation initiatives and the and the and the innovation office. And and so it, you know there's sort of lots of good things going on even if they're not you know, going on in the exact same way in, uh, in different places. Excellent. Um, I, I just want to remind listeners, we just have 10 minutes left in this uh, really interesting webinar, and we are very happy to take questions from you. Uh, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of the uh, Zoom um, uh, platform, and you can uh, pose a question. It will come to me, and I'll pose it on your behalf. So please uh, do use that if you have any questions for our two panelists. Let's talk a little bit about where the uh, rubber meets the road uh, implementation, the interaction between PBR and um, you know, the actual uh, application of these principles by the insurance industry. And, and let's start with the role of ingrained attitudes within regulated entities, perhaps within regulators as well. Uh, to what extent is that a challenge, Stuart? Um, I mean, I think it's sort of a, a challenge and, and an opportunity. I, I think both for regulators and for industry, implementing a principle or moving towards a principles-based regime and taking the most advantage of that requires somewhat of a change in, in mindset and a more sort of holistic outcome-oriented kind of approach that we've talked about. It requires some um, embracing or comfort with ambiguity and not having just the 60 kilometer an hour sign. And so you need to have some comfort uh, with that. I think it requires more engagement from boards and senior management to implement this properly and, and make it work. Um, I think you also need to do it right and particularly in a big institution, I think you need very high caliber, very able individuals and teams who can be very, thoughtful and strategic and, and creative in how they implement it. And it's not just 60 kilometers an hour. And I, I think you eventually, I think in a bunch of those roles, legal compliance, audit, governance, and so on, ideally the implementation takes those team members from being more referees to being more like coaches on a sports team. So instead of these are the rules and this is what we have to do, it's more like Okay, as a coach, how do we move the ball down the field or put the ball in the net or that kind of thing? And, and so you're more sort of coaching and implementing more than just being rules oriented. So, uh, which, is, which is all good. And the thing I would say too about needing very high caliber people, I think that applies to the regulators too. And as part of the movement of a bunch of the regulators to being basically self-regulatory bodies, independent arms length agencies, you know, you also have that need there it's a, a two-way street. Excellent. Uh, Christy, I'd like to uh, build on that and speak a little bit more about something we touched on, which is business culture. And I'll just mention as an association that, uh, you know, we're very supportive of the fair treatment of culture, uh, fair treatment of customers, excuse me, um, uh, approach. But one of the issues we've had discussions with regulators about is that it is to, to a significant extent about culture and it can be quite difficult to demonstrate that you're doing it. It's difficult to measure uh, 
something as ambiguous as culture. So we, we really find it valuable to hear your thoughts and insights on that whole issue. Well, I sure hear that. Uh, uh, it is uh, it is hard to measure culture, and uh, I mean that uh, that that is an ongoing. It, sometimes I think everything comes down to culture. Uh, culture eats everything else for breakfast, right? But uh, but but I, I think the way to demonstrate culture and to build a compliance culture is really to. Uh, you know, through ongoing conversation with regulators. And I guess, you know, and there is a, a, a shift that is required on the part of regulated entities as well. So, you know, compliance uh, needs to be integrated, not siloed. Uh, uh, you know, the goal should not be to avoid the regulator. Uh, you know, in, industry actors to some extent can both create a, a more productive culture and demonstrate that to regulators by uh, sort of pivoting toward early engagement with regulators. Uh, you know, if you run into a problem, you find that, you know, you're offside on something, rather than hiding it, reporting it right away, talking to the regulator as someone who is helping you to problem solve. And then on the assumption that the regulator isn't going to re reach for the stick right away either, um, you know, that they might be forced to reach for the stick if you don't report, right? That the, the failure of communication is a much bigger problem than, you know, whatever it is that might have happened. Uh, and, uh, and, and so in that way, I think uh, sort of understanding the regulator as, um, as someone who wants to create uh, good outcomes for everyone wherever possible, but cannot let bad actors, you know, repeat bad actors uh, wreck it for everyone else, so to speak. Um, I think is uh, you know to that that sort of shift in understanding about the relationship with the regulator. It takes time. It takes communication. It takes tone at the top, right, from the board and senior uh, management to to really instantiate that. And uh, you know, and I guess I would just add that you know, good enforcement, strong enforcement, and a meaningful regulatory regime is good for industry as well, right? You want to weed out those bad actors because the whole industry suffers if, uh, if there's a big scandal. And what you'll see often in response to a big scandal is a crackdown, more onerous regulation that imposes costs on good actors as well as bad, that might end up being more rules-based, that doesn't provide the level of flexibility that you would have under a principles-based regime. Um, and, you know, I guess I would mention that that's um, the justification that the BCFSA put forward in explaining their new rule on incident reporting. So their evidence was that in other jurisdictions, uh, there was a failure to report security incidents um, under the guidance that existed. And therefore, they made the decision that moving to a detailed rule was um, necessary because of that lack of um, reported compliance. And so, you know, so, so staying in a cooperative, communicative relationship and thinking about compliance as actually being part of your business model, uh, I think is, is the culture change that's necessary. Well, that's a, that is a perfect segue, Christy, to a question from the audience that I'll ask you first and then Stuart before we wrap things up. And the question is, could a rule-based system be the outcome from a business entity failing a principle-based um, uh, regime system or a principle-based regulation system? And would this be, in your view, an appropriate approach? Do you want to, I'm sorry, do you want to take that, Stuart, or shall I? Well, I'm happy to have, have you go first. I'll, I'll chime in. Uh, yeah, so I think, um, I, I think that certainly there are some regimes that have done that around, around the world, and I think it can actually make sense. So if you, um, you know, if you have demonstrated that you can't, uh, that you can't actually engage in this sort of principles-based way, uh, you know, thinking about moving to rules is kind of ratcheting up the enforcement pressure on people, right? And, uh, and it signals to that actor that, you know, you're not building the trust you need to build in the principles-based world, and we're going to have to supervise you more carefully and expect more specific things of you. Um, and I don't, I don't think that's inappropriate. I think there should always be room to sort of also support that actor, help them uh, maybe get back onto the, you know, black side of the ledger. Uh, but I don't think it's inappropriate. Mm 
Thank you. Yeah, I think you, you could have that reaction or have that sort of pendulum uh, swing back. And I think, and as a general observation, I think that could happen. And as a general observation, when we're talking about principles-based, I think there's a tendency to think about it mainly at the provincial market conduct level. But a lot of the early moves in the area were by OSFI at the federal level, whether it was reinsurance risk management, this is going back more than 10 years, reinsurance risk management, background checks on directors and officers, reinsurance security, ORSA, all pushed down to the industry. OSFI wanting to not be party to trust agreements or to background checks, to push it all down to the industry. So I think it's all just as applicable at the at the federal prudential level as it is at the provincial level. Great, well, we're coming to the end. I uh, just have a quick question for you, Stuart, and then final comments from each of you. Um, question for you, Stuart, is are there any regulators out there internationally, in, in other words, in other countries, that you would view as role models in terms of uh, practicing PBR and who regulators in industry in Canada should be looking to um, for ideas and for benchmarking purposes? The, the, so no, there isn't one that immediately leaps to mind that is really the exemplar or the sort of epitome of what we should be doing. I mean, I think really Canada's at the leading edge of all that, and we should all be quite grateful and, and thankful for that. And the industry has much better relationships with its regulators than industries do in a lot of other countries, in particular the U.S., um, you know, or in the UK, for some example, and part of that's cultural, part of its history. I mean, I, mean I, I think it's really just more of watching what's going on, and not just in insurance, but in financial services and in regulation more generally, and, you know, seeing wherever the best seeming principles, you know, are, are emerging around the world. I, I, I don't think of one jurisdiction as being, but here's, here, Christy's probably got an even better view than that on me. I don't know that I do. I mean, so Stuart mentioned the FSA in the UK as being a leader in principles-based regulation before the financial crisis. And, you know, the evidence is that it was, that their treating customers fairly regime actually was extremely effective and very successful. You know, the FSA uh, on the banking side had its own set of issues, uh, uh, which were separate. Um, but now I do think it's, I think it's, it's quite accurate to say right. Canada's out in front. Yeah. And in, in particular, I think we should be grateful that we don't have the regimes in some countries where the regulatory regime is really principally a revenue generating kind of regulator. They used to call the FSA the fine slapping authority. And, and so it's not revenue generator. And it's typically not a political stepping stone like in the U.S. where the state insurance commissioner then really wants to run for attorney general and then governor. And I think both those things are problematic or from a Canadian perspective, we would think that those are not great regimes. And so we should be grateful that we're not in either of those. Excellent. Well, you've been a terrific panel. Uh, we only have a few seconds left because we've come to the end of our time. I do want to mention to attendees that this webinar is being recorded and in a few days time will be posted on our website. So uh, if you have a colleague who couldn't attend, who uh, you think would be um, in interested in this uh, webinar, it will be available for you. Uh, Stuart, Christy, final words of wisdom. Start with you, Stuart. You know, I, I think it's encouraging that we're all sort of on this um, journey together and lots of great things happening. I, it would be nicer if there was more harmonization, har harmonization in certain respects. But I mean, I think we're, we're, I think things are a lot better than they were maybe 20 years ago, both at the federal level, uh, OSFI and the FCAC, and at, at the provincial levels. And so, it, it, you know, we'll, I had a long, long list of all the stuff that's come out in the last two years. So it's certainly a very busy, fertile time for all this. Chris, Christy? I guess I would just say that, you know, it's a process. All of this is a process, but the process of learning and engaging with a, you know, principles-based regulator is the point and it continues and, uh, and, 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 I think it's it's quite clear that there are real positive outcomes to a well-implemented principles-based regime. Fantastic. Well, Stuart, Christy, you're so insightful, uh, so interesting to uh, listen to. I can't tell you how much on behalf of Kathy, we appreciate your sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you to all the attendees today. Um, this ends our webinar and I wish all of you a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Christy.